Hi, my name is Nicole Hoffman, and I'm giving a presentation titled The Cognitive Stairways of Analysis. This presentation is going to be a story about how I unintentionally created my own analytic framework. Uh, it all started with a blog post, um, and it's come a long way, and I'm, I'm really proud of how far it's come. So if you're interested in analysis, or you just like good stories, or cognitive science for that matter, stick around, because it's going to be a, a good presentation. So a little bit more about me. Um, I'm currently an intelligence analyst at GroupSense. Whoop, don't know why it's doing that. Sorry about that. So I'm currently an intelligence analyst at GroupSense. I have a bachelor's in information technology with a minor in cybersecurity. I have a blog currently at, uh, you can get to it at threathuntergirl.com. Uh, my passions lie in threat research and analysis. My family just recently moved to Texas, and it's been a lot of fun on weekends and sometimes in the evenings exploring and trying new food. Um, when I sign off uh, from work and get away from screens, I really love comic books, um, whether that be physical comic books, digital comic books, um, cinematic universes, I, I love it all. Really anything in the sci-fi sphere, uh, sphere, I'm really into. Also, medical dramas is also a notable mention. And if you want to reach me on Twitter, uh, my handle is ThreatHunterGirl without the I in girl. So going over the agenda, I'm going to begin my presentation by discussing the topic of analysis and what it is and some of the challenges that I faced um, as an analyst uh, that led to uh, me to want to pursue more information. Next, I'm going to go over six analytic models um, that I researched during my deep dive into it, the analytic tradecraft. I did go over um, or I did look into more models, um, which you can read in my blog post. But uh, for this presentation, I'm just going to focus on six. Um, then I'm going to go over my framework, which is the cognitive stairways of analysis. Right now, there are four. Um, it started out with three, so I'm going to go over all four. Um, and then I'm going to apply the fourth stairway to an intelligence investigation. And then conclude with some helpful resources. So what is analysis? You might hear this term all the time, but what does it really mean? How do you analyze data? Unfortunately, this is something I had to learn um, on my own when I started out in InfoSec. As a, a, my first role was a cybersecurity analyst intern. And I've learned a lot since that day, but I still feel like there's a huge gap in training when it comes to analysts and data analysis. So I wanted to take a deeper dive um, into the trade craft of analysis last year. Um, and as I researched the topic, um, I found like there was a lot of great information, but there wasn't a lot of information um, specifically for cyber threat analysis, at least not how to perform the analysis. You know, I felt like analysis itself was a step in a lot of frameworks or, or a step in a lot of processes, but no one was really going over, well, what's happening in that step? How, how do you analyze the data? What are you looking for? What's going through your mind? What is your brain doing? How do you know you're analyzing it the same way as someone else? And if you aren't analyzing it the same way, is that okay? You know, um, so I decided to expand my search and look at how are other industries performing analysis and what can I learn from them, you know, if they expand upon uh, this step of analysis. Um, and when I first gave this presentation, um, I did get a lot of feedback regarding, well, there's so much written about analysis. Why didn't you read this? And why didn't you read this? Well, 
when you're doing your own research and it's just for fun, you're not going to uh, you're not going to identify every possible source. And that's one of the great things about the internet and communication and really a collaborative project like the cognitive stairways of analysis. If you know of a great analytic source, please send it my way. I am happy to read it. Um, really implore others to not only contribute sources, but also their own take on the stairways. It's not a, you know, one person or I don't know what I'm trying to say, but <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is I understand that there's a lot of sources out there, but there wasn't enough for me when I was starting out and I did the research last summer and I just felt like I could add value. And so that is what I did. The first model that I want to go over is titled a cognitive interpretation of data analysis. And this is a white paper um, by Garrett Grohlman and Hadley Wickham. The authors of this white paper compare the process of sense making to the process of data analysis. But when I first read this, I thought, well, what's sense making? Well, sense making is the process of how our brains make sense of the world around us. More specifically, our mind um, or the human mind creates and manages internal cognitive structures that represent certain aspects of reality. And the authors um, define these models or schemas as um, mental models that contain like a wide range of information um, about a specific object or concept. And the schemas are organized in um, something called a semantic network inside of our brain. Um, so this was really interesting to me um, and it made a lot of sense because analysts are regularly creating hypotheses and um, either, you know, before or after uh, the analysis and trying to determine, you know, is this information valid? You know, do, have I, do I already have a schema to match this data? Um, you know, is there any discrepancies about the data? Do I need to throw this out? Um, and one of the best um, examples that I can uh, think of when it comes to um, understanding the process of sense making is picture yourself as a child experiencing a thunderstorm for the first time. Your brain may not know what's going on, but it will start collecting information about this event. And then it will store this information in a schema and it will title it, you know, like let's say rainstorm. The next time you experience a rainstorm, let's say it also has thunder and lightning. Your brain will try to match the data to the rainstorm schema and determine, do I need to create a new schema? Or do I need to update this schema? Or is this information not valid and do I need to throw it out? And those are the three things that your brain does when you experience a new event. It either creates a new schema, updates an existing schema, or it just determines that this observation is untrustworthy and then it just throws it out. Um, kind of like sometimes when you feel like you see something in the corner of your eye and then you look and then you're like, hmm, maybe I didn't see something and you can't explain it. So your brain just decides it didn't happen. That's kind of what sense making is. And that's really interesting. So I felt like the authors, or not the authors, but just the process of sense making, I felt like it it really just defines analysis and what it is at its most simplest term. Um, so I kind of really nerded out over the process of sense making as a, a lot of others, uh, analysts in the field, I think have uh, at some point or another found sense making. So then um, the authors of this white paper compared the process of sense making to the process of data analysis. So this more specifically, 
they broke it down into um, exploratory and confirmatory analysis. Exploratory analysis is one that starts with no hypothesis or any preconceived notions about the data. You just start exploring the data and then you try to find like a relevant schema after you explore the data. Whereas confirmatory analysis, it starts with a hypothesis and then you try to validate the data to the hypothesis. So for example, when my computer is super slow and laggy, um, even though nine out of 10 times, it's probably going to be a Windows update, I'll still explore around and see what do I have running? What's taking up the CPU? What, what, what's going on? Is it my internet? And like I said, nine times out of 10, it's a Windows update. You would think the next time it would happen, I would start with confirmatory analysis and think, oh, it's probably a Windows update. I know this from past experiences. And then try to validate that by looking and seeing, oh, do I have any updates? Let me validate my hypothesis. And that's kind of what exploratory and confirmatory analysis are. So my key takeaway from this model was confirmatory and exploratory analysis. The next model I wanna go over is called the statistical investigation process. And this was uh, written by, or it was created by Dr. Christopher Chatfield, and it was published in his book titled Problem Solving, A Statistician's Guide. Within this process, I was immediately drawn to step three, which is assess the structure and quality of the data or clean the data. And I personally um, break this down into two steps. So I broke it down into two key takeaways, which is um, I broke it down into quality of information check or QOI check. And this is where you're checking the completeness of the data um, you're checking your confidence level. How confident are you with the source? If it's not a really confident source, um, you might have to collect more data so that you can boost that confidence level. Whereas cleaning the data is, you know, omitting any useless data, making sure um, if you're working with like a large data set, and let's say you're like querying a database, you might do some data normalization to make sure that like, let's say you have a field within the data set where it's like city. And some people who, who put together the data set put SD for San Diego instead of writing out San Diego, where then other people put the full word San Diego. And let's say you don't know that there's different versions and so you go to query it, um, you're going to miss out on a lot of information. So it's going to affect the completeness of your analysis. Um, so that's why you want to normalize it so that you make sure you get all the results that you need so you can do the full analysis. Um, the next part of this process that I thought was really interesting was the select step, which is where I think most of the analysis is taking place. And I felt like um, this process um, that the author put together is really taking an exploratory approach to analysis because it starts with a data set and um, it's like a group of variables um, in the text. And um, a model is then created after exploring the data. And um, the author refers to this as regression analysis and it's really where um, you have a group of variables, um, sometimes it could just be two variables, and you're trying to find a relationship or an underlying structure between the variables. And I thought this was really interesting because I felt like it's kind of like, an, uh, I felt like it expanded upon the process of exploratory analysis. Um, so I took that as a key takeaway for this process. And to go over, um, regression analysis a little um, more so you kind of understand. Um, if you think back to grade school, um, if you remember those math problems where you're provided a series of numbers and they say, 
um, find the pattern. If you're given a, a number set like this one, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, you might immediately know, oh, well, it's adding 2 each time. And you may know this because you, you just know it by memory at this point. But let's say you have this pattern, which is 28, 20, 13, 7, 2. You may not immediately generate a hypothesis like you did with the previous data set. So you have to explore the data and then generate a hypothesis. So you might immediately, or you might first say, okay, well, 28 and 20. There's eight difference. Maybe it's subtracting eight each time. Okay, well, 20 minus eight is not 13. So that can't be right. So that hypothesis has now been proven wrong. So then you subtract, you do 20 minus 13, oh, it's seven. Perhaps you might come to the conclusion that the number being subtracted is being, uh, it is subtracted by one each time. It's, it's going down by one each time. So it's eight, seven, six, five, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you could validate that hypothesis with the data set. And that's kind of um, what you're doing with regression analysis is you're trying to, uh, you know, explore that data and, and try to find that underlying structure or pattern. So the next process I want to go over um, is actually one of my uh, one of the most favorite ones that I that I uh, researched, and it's the model of police operational intelligence analysis. And it's from a white paper titled How Analysts Think, Think Steps as a Tool for Structuring, Sensemaking, and Criminal Intelligence Analysis. And I don't want to totally butcher the author's names, but I do have them listed. And I do have um, each of these resources um, in a slide at the end of the, of the presentation, and I'll be making my slides available. So this model is broken down into three stages. Um, which is prepare, analyze, and report slash advice. And I, like I said, I, I absolutely love this model for a number of reasons, but specifically it breaks down the analysis step um, into different stages. It doesn't go too far, but it, it um, does more than just say analyze. So um, I just felt like you know, we as an analyst community cannot just assume that everyone has the same definition of analysis. Um, and instead of just writing, analyze the data, you know, perhaps take a lesson um, out of this model's book um, and break things down into further steps um, so that less experienced analysts are not just pondering if they're doing it right um, because that's kind of, at least for me, where imposter syndrome starts, is you know knowing all the stuff you don't know and start, starting to freak out. So this um, process starts with a briefing from an investigator. And then the, um, intelligence, or the criminal intelligence analyst would then establish think steps. Think steps provide a template that enables the analyst to approach the case decompose it into separate elements, and classify associated data accordingly. So in other words, the criminal analysts are attempting to choose a schema or multiple schemas to match the data in the case to. Um, and for um, criminal analysts, the schemas would be like crimes, like, um, like murder, burglary, human trafficking, things like that. And each crime has its own set of think steps or, excuse me, things for the analyst to think about when they're looking at the evidence of the case. And it's kind of like how when um, in information security, when we're analyzing an incident, um, like let's say if it's a, a malware, we might have different things or different think steps that we want to think about when we're investigating that. You know, if we're investigating a domain, we want we might have certain things that we ask ourselves 
um, that we want to think about, things to consider and things like that. Um, so the idea of, of think steps is really one of the best pieces of analytic advice I think I've really ever received. Um, and it really um, captures like that. Um, I can't think of the right word. The, that I think it's like tacit versus... I can't think of it. I wrote a blog about it, but there's certain types of knowledge that you have specifically um, in like a work environment. There's some of it's it's easy to write down. Some of it you just kind of know from experience um, and, and capturing um, that information from like senior analysts. It could be so helpful, so useful um, to expand upon like standard operating procedures and things like that. Um, so think steps, I think, are really important. Um, and if you can take anything away from this presentation, I hope that it can be think steps because I literally use them on a daily basis and they help me out a lot. It's kind of like when they when you hear like take notes after you experience um, an investigation so you know what to think about next time. Think steps, right? So I'm so glad that, you know, I, I kind of stepped out of my comfort zone and found this um, model of police operational intelligence anal analysis so that I could find this key takeaway of think steps. But um, moving, moving on, <laughs> I could talk about think steps all day. Um, so then after you, he, uh, he or uh, she or they have the think steps, they can then go forward and request more information, more data. Um, you know, if, if there's certain things that they need to consider, they get more background research based on that data, um, structure the data, and then, you know, query the case database if they need to, schematize the data if we think back to uh, exploratory analysis and so the process of sense making, um, and then recreate the path, which is putting the pieces together. Um, and then obviously the dissemination, whether it be oral, written, and so on and so forth. So this is a really interesting model and definitely one of my favorites. So the next model that I want to talk to you about is the business analytic model life cycle. Um, and this was from an article written by Michael Coveney. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, that he wrote, um, and there was a lot of um, processes and models um, in business analytics, but this one I really liked because of the sixth step, which is monitor the model performance. I thought that was really interesting, and I thought, you know, that might be super helpful maybe in a future stairway. I didn't add it as a key takeaway, but I thought hmm, that might be really interesting for something like, you know, if you had a process of like creating um, a policy or something like that, where you want to monitor the performance um, and then maybe update it as needed if, um, if the policy or something isn't working. So I just thought that was really interesting and something I hadn't seen before. Um, and then the key takeaway from this one was actually the uh, determine the scope. I realized I was covering up part of the words. <laughs> so uh, my key takeaway from this model um, is determine the scope. And I got that from the first step, which is define what is being investigated. And this wasn't the first um, model or process or framework that I found where they're kind of determining or defining what their investigation is going to uh, contain. But it's the first time, or when I was going through this um, model, it um, was the first time I thought about it. And I and maybe it was just the use of the word define. Um, and I just thought, you know, how important it is specifically um, in cybersecurity and really an intelligence uh, analysis, you want to make sure you're defining what's being investigated, what's the scope, what's allowed, what's not allowed, how um, 
in depth does it need to be? What's what's the final product? Is there a deadline? All these things you need to know up front because it's going to um, impact your investigation and how speedy it is and, and things like that. So I, I really enjoyed um, this model and, and that key takeaway. And again, I might add number six, the model, monitor the model performance in the future. Um, if you have any ideas of, of uh, ways that you could use this, um, definitely let me know because I think it could be really interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry, my camera is moving around. I'm still getting used to um, pre-recording when you have like huge um, graphics in your slides, but just bear with me. So this next model that I'm going over is um, the diagnostic um, process model, and it's from a book titled uh, Improving Diagnostics in Healthcare, and it has a lot of authors, um, the Committee on Diagnostic Error in Healthcare, the Board on Healthcare Services, the Institute of Medicine and National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, and like I said earlier in the presentation, I actually came, I think I mentioned it, maybe I didn't. I came from the medical field before I got into um, uh, InfoSec. I actually came from the medical field and then I got into uh, financial fraud and then I moved into InfoSec. So that'd be really interesting to include a process from the medical field um, and trying to think of like the analytic process of like a nurse or a doctor. Um, and and I, so I really wanted to include this model. This one was really interesting. Um, mostly because um, of like the cycl cyclical process in, in the, the middle that you see. Um, and they kind of, you know, took information, they collected it, and uh, like as they're doing the physical examination and uh, collecting data from the patient, they determine, or, you know, they got a working diagnosis and they continue to uh, collect information, whether it be from a clinical history, physical exam, um, the, the, you know, the, the testing that they do and, and things like that. Um, but they're basically, um, taking a cyclical approach to the uh, collection and analysis phase. Um, and they're interpreting that into a working diagnosis. Um, one of the main things I thought was really interesting with this um, framework or, or this process was the treatment step. Um, and it just made me think immediately about like an, an InfoSec, like if you're in a client vendor relationship, um, how, like, I know, like, personally, I am on the vendor side, so I have a list of clients and things like that that I help out, and there are times where I only get part of a story, like, they say, hey, Nicole, can you help me out with this, and they give me, like, part of the story, and then I have to ask questions, and then sometimes um, when I give them information, they have to ask questions, and we both kind of sometimes forget that I can't do like a physical examination of things that are going on in their environment, kind of like a doctor does, because, you know, if I was a doctor, there's so many things that you can get from their clinical history and their uh, medical file, but doing a in-person physical examination is completely different and it could change everything. It could change everything that you see in the file. And this is kind of what we need to think about in InfoSec, you know, when we're giving information to a vendor, we have to realize they can't do a physical examination. So let's try to answer every question that they might have because um, they can't see what I see. And it can be hard to kind of step back and get like, you know, t look at your problem from like a holistic approach. 
Um, and same like if you're a vendor and you're talking to a client, you know that you can't do a physical examination and that you're going to have follow-up questions. So try to get those up front so that you don't have to go back later. Um, but my key takeaway um, from this was actually the treatment plan. And because, and the treatment plan to me is the dissemination. It's the so what. what so, you know, this is the diagnosis. This is the treatment plan. These are my recommendations. This is my full report. And so I thought that was really interesting and definitely a great key takeaway. So, um, I don't know, I don't think I talk about it that much on Twitter, um, but something interesting about me is I'm kind of a huge meteorology nerd. Um, I discuss it sometimes, but probably not as much as I should uh, nerd out about it. Um, actually, when I was growing up, I really wanted to be a um, meteorologist, but then I found out... Um, how much math was involved, and I'm awful at math, so it, it I knew it, I knew immediately it wouldn't work out. But I've always just been really fascinated by weather and and, and storms, and really love uh, watching. I could watch the Weather Channel all day, um, so I I just really wanted to like you know really dive into that analytic process. Um, I dived into the scientific process, which you can read in my blog, but I really wanted to squeeze in a process specifically in the field of meteorology. So um, this model that I found is um, called the Simple Weather Forecasting Workflow, and is actually from a white paper, um, not specifically about meteorology, but it was uh, it's titled Optimization of a Heterogeneous Simulations Workflow. And again, I don't want to mess up their names, but I do have it included and I do have a link um, to the white paper in the resources. Um, and this model is kind of cut off, but the first step is understanding the environment. And um, I think it says like air and water um, for this particular process. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, it really just kind of establishes kind of like just determining the scope, but a little bit further, it's really understanding the environment that you're collecting information from. Um, and this was the first process that I found that defined the specific environment and not so much like, I guess it could be an involved in determining the scope. Um, but I just thought it was really important specifically, you know, if you're investigating something like internal to the firewall, let's say you're uh, in a sock and something happens to the CEO's computer, you're not going to go then look at like Karen and HR's computer because it didn't happen on her computer. So <laughs> understanding the environment and where the information or the incident took place is really important. Um, so then they, in this process, uh, they look over or they have like a, a time period that they're uh, measuring data and then they're collecting and processing that data that they've collected over that specific time period. And then they're analyzing it, um, doing some mathematics, and then the model can actually uh, takes two paths. It can either go to a statistical interpretation, subjective meteorology, uh, uh, subjective interpretation by a meteorologist, um, or it can do the direct model output and or DMO. And uh, this is an objective weather forecasting technique, which consists of determining a statistical relationship between uh, uh, predicted and uh, predicted variables. Uh, by a numerical model at some projection times. Um, and it's, in effect, uh, the determination of weather-related statistics of a numerical model. Again, lots of math <laughs> inside of uh, 
meteorology, but still very fascinating. Um, and then it can go down to statistical post-processing, um, and such as like the Kalman filtering is uh, what you could see as one of the examples, and it's also written in the, the white paper. And this is a complex statistical algorithm, and it's kind of like a process of confirmatory analysis where they're um, validating that the data fits the schema. And then again, um, either way, either path you go is going to do that subjective interpretation by the meteorologist. And I really liked that step because I felt like it's kind of like an additional layer of confirmatory analysis, kind of like peer review. I mean, I guess for this particular one, it would be like an expert review. And I thought that would, it was really interesting and, and maybe a step that I can add in the future um, for like more complex analysis investigations where you kind of want um, additional team members to kind of like review it to make sure it kind of makes sense. And then of course, the, the weather forecast for users. So my key takeaway from this process was the um, understanding the environment and really like defining the environment, which would kind of get rolled up into the determine the scope. So I listed all my key takeaways, you know, from the first one, um, exploratory and confirmatory analysis. And that, excuse me, was from the process of um, sense making and how they compared it to exploratory and confirmatory analysis. Um, from Christopher Chatfield's statistical investigation process, we have three key takeaways. We have clean the data, quality of information check, regression analysis. And cleaning the data, if you remember, is getting rid of any useless data, data normalization, whereas quality of information check is really where you're checking the completeness of the data, how confident you are with the sources, do you need more information? Um, and then regression analysis, if you remember back, is trying to find that underlying relationship between different variables and, um, or like a, a pattern. And then from the model of police operational intelligence analysis, we have my favorite, think steps, which are very important. Um, and those are kind of things to consider from previous investigations. And they kind of help you um, as you're investigating something. Sixth key takeaway is from the business analytic model lifecycle. And that was determining the scope of the investigation. And my seventh key takeaway is the treatment plan, or the, I say confirmatory analysis, but it's really, if you think about it, part of the dissemination. It is confirming uh, your diagnosis or your hypothesis, but it's really your recommendations um, at the end of the investigation. And that was from the medical diagnostic process model. And the final key takeaway is from the weather forecasting process. And this is understanding your environment that you're investigating. So moving right into my framework, the cognitive stairways of analysis. Um, I have four stairways right now. This is the first one. Each stairway starts um, and finishes instead of being like a cycle. Um, there are some optional cycles, but overall there is a beginning and an end uh, because there's always going to be a dissemination. Um, and that's kind of why I picked the name stairway because it's always going to start and finish um, with dissemination. And I feel like the dissemination is one of the most important parts, not the most important part, but is one of the most important parts. Um, obviously the experience that you have throughout the investigation is very useful and educational, but I feel like it mostly determines um, the dissemination and, and how you can um, uh, how you can respond and uh, provide that feedback after your investigation and explain it um, to either a technical audience or a non-technical audience. Super important. So stepping right in, 
Um, this particular stairway was the first stairway and it started with an alert. Next, you're determining the scope. And remember, this is where you're setting, you're understanding the environment. If you need to pull logs from the CEO's device because something happened on their computer, you're not gonna go look at a device in HR because that wouldn't make sense. So determine the scope, determine the deadline, and determine uh, the environment that you're investigating. Step three is compiling the data and quality of information check. So as you're compiling data, look at the sources. Are you confident with the source? Are you not confident? You may need to compile additional data. Step four is cleaning the data, omitting any useless data. And step five is EDA or exploratory data analysis. Um, and this can really depend on you as an analyst. Um, uh, you can use a visualization tool like a graph. You can use uh, like workflows. You can use Excel, which I personally think is great. Um, you could, you know, draw out mind maps. However, you explore data best, and how whatever works for you is what I recommend. I personally use. Um, Excel the most. Um, and then regression analysis is really just trying to find the underlying structure or pattern between different variables. Sometimes there's not going to be a pattern. Sometimes there's not going to be relationships between variables and you have to understand that and it's okay. Um, and next step, number six, is generating a hypothesis. What do you think is going on? What is the story that you think um, and generating those think steps. And, or if you already have think steps, just going and getting the think steps. I um, mean, remember the think steps are um, the specific things that you wanna consider from like previous investigations or, or like templates um, that help you um, think about the case and questions that you wanna ask. Um, and so you can start using those when you go to confirmatory analysis in the next step. And remember, exploratory analysis is where you don't have any preconceived notion or hypotheses about the data. Confirmatory analysis, you have a hypothesis that you've already created. You're now validating that the data meets the schema that you, the schema being the hypothesis. After you've confirmed the data, can move on to disseminate, whether that's an oral report, written report, and so on and so forth. If your hypothesis, if you cannot validate it, you can go back and explore the data to be able to create a new hypothesis. Sometimes you just need to collect a little bit more information and then you can confirm the data. That is okay as well. So um, the second stairway begins with a brainstorm session. So it's a little bit different than the first stairway. So this is uh, a great stairway for like, if your CISO or manager ever asks you like, hey, I saw this thing on the news, are we susceptible to this? And you can just start thinking right away, hmm, well, I, I'm already thinking about it. I can already generate, well, these are, these are the ways that I think that it could happen. Um, these are some things to consider. So you're already thinking about think steps. You can get all that information ready. After you've come up, um, you've finished your brainstorm, you can go straight into determining the scope, which is determining um, the environment that you're investigating, determining um, the end product and, and things like that. Um, and then you can go into what's known as uh, the key, key assumptions check or KAC for short. And key assumptions check is an analytic technique where you write down, um, or you can just think about it, um, all your assumptions about any given topic and determine the likelihood if that assumption is true. It seems kind of silly, but when you're Doing it specifically when you're in a group can be really helpful about fleshing out certain biases that you may not realize that you have. 
Um, and Devil's Advocate is another great one for flushing out those biases. It's really just trying to think of every, like if you put yourself um, in, not like necessarily an attacker, but you're you're basically just trying to think of like every possible alternative to the hypothesis to prove it wrong. And it's just a great way, both of them are a great way to flush out biases and, and just put everything out on the table. The next step is, um, is you can start compiling data. And as you're compiling the data, check the quality of the data. Are you confident that the data and the, and the data sources, does everything look right? Um, and then you can start cleaning the data. Get rid of anything that's not pertinent to your investigation. Omit it. If you need to organize the data, you need to clean it to make it easier to analyze, go ahead and do that now. Since you already have a um, hypothesis, you don't need to visualize the data. You don't need to try to find an underlying you know, structure. You can just go right on to confirmatory analysis to confirm that the data meets your um, hypothesis or, or validate it. But I usually just like to <laughs> explore the data anyway, um, just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, but I am not everyone, so I just put it as optional. Um, otherwise, you can just move straight on to confirmatory um, and, and then dissemination. And uh, Again, obviously, if you cannot confirm that the data meets the hypothesis or the schema, you can just go back to either brainstorm or you can um, go back to, to visualizing the data and kind of try to determine what you missed. So um, the third stairway, um, this one can start um, one of two ways. The first way is if you're doing like a, an audit on like a specific asset, if you're like trying to determine how safe that is or um, anything like that, this is the stairway for that because you already kind of know um, a specific thing that you're trying to determine um, from a malicious standpoint, um, how it can be exploited. The other way that this one can start is if you're ever just like doing not even an investigation, you're just kind of like going about your daily business and you just you either read an article or you're or you're doing something at work and you and you think about something and you're like, I wonder if I can exploit that. You know, you're already thinking about it from an attacker's point of view. You can immediately start this framework. And that's really the red team analysis. It's where you're putting yourself in the attacker's shoes. You can immediately generate hypotheses, um, whether it be one or multiple. Think about those think steps. If you know, if you already have them, go collect them. And if you don't have them, you know, write them down because they'll be useful not only for you during your investigation, but they could also be used for others in your organization for training purposes. Um, you can start compiling the data, check the quality of the information of the data, make sure everything looks right, um, make sure that it's complete. Make sure you're confident in the findings. Clean the data. If you need to normalize anything, um, get rid of useless stuff that's not pertinent to your investigation. Specifically, um, when I made the omit useless data, I, I was thinking about like threat hunting and certain fields that you want to get rid of um, when you're, you know, like querying a large database. But it's also useful in other forms of analysis, like intelligence analysis and things like that, because um, sometimes you do collect a lot of data. But there's one particular use case I wanted to mention. And then once again, since you already have a hypothesis, you don't need to explore the data or do any type of regression analysis, but you can if you want to. Um, I sometimes still do. You, or you can just move on to confirmatory analysis to confirm your hypothesis and then obviously disseminate the results. Um, this stairway, I feel like, at least for me personally, goes a lot faster than the other, uh, the first two stairways because I'm kind of already thinking about something um, and trying to find um, if, if it's exploitable or not. 
So the the final stairway, this one is a little bit different than the others. Um, special thanks to Juan Spinell. Hopefully I said her name correctly. Um, he helped me out a lot during the creation of this stairway that focuses on intelligence investigations. <coughs> Excuse me. So this one starts with a trigger, which is really... Um, Anything that starts the investigation, whether it be an alert, an idea, um, a request, anything that starts the investigation, that would be the trigger. Um, and then you determine the scope, similar to the other framework or to the, the other stairways. Um, you're understanding the scope. You're understanding what is the end product, who is the audience, um, what's the deadline. Um, this, um, Juan really helped me figure out that the scope really um, affects the end product. Um, gather relevant think steps. Previously, I had this with generate hypothesis, but I moved it down um, because I feel like um, as you're creating think steps, it could be more useful for you to have those think steps at the beginning of the investigation versus the end of the investigation because then you kind of have to backtrack. Um, and then you can go right into a cyclical process. Um, which is the data enumeration process that's basically collecting data or compiling data, um, exploring the data, checking the quality of information, omitting useless data. And we kind of came, me and Juan kind of came to the conclusion, like we're kind of doing this on a um, kind of all of it at once as you're collecting data. I'm, I'm, uh, exploring it, I'm I'm looking for anything that's uh, useful, getting rid of stuff I don't need, um, and then as I'm researching the information, I'm starting to create the story. I'm creating information from data, so I'm starting my report. I'm starting to put key findings in my report. I'm pivoting off information within my um, like things that I find. Um, like if I find that a domain is communicating with malware, well, then I'm going to pivot and start investigating that malware so that I can include that in my report. So pivoting is very important. Um, and then once I have a story put together, like the so what, um, as I'm creating information, I can create a hypothesis or um, not necessarily you're always going to have like a specific hypothesis like this happened, but you might have... Um, this is kind of what I think is happening, and these are my recommendations. And then you can go into that confirmatory analysis and validate what you believe is true. Look for anything that doesn't look right and review your think steps and ensure there's no like data sources you missed or any things that you need to consider um, before you can uh, move on to dissemination. And then obviously, if you prove your hypothesis wrong, you can go back and collect more information. So I'm going to apply this uh, fourth stairway to an intelligence investigation. And I don't have too much time, so I'm going to kind of go a little bit fast, but I will answer any question that you may have after the presentation. So let's say the trigger is a request from a client to investigate a phishing email with a susp suspicious link. As we determine the scope, we're thinking about who's the audience. Who is the expected, or what is the expected product? Is it a full report? Is it a technical report? Is it for an executive audience? Is it needed just an executive summary and a technical portion? When's the deadline? Um, ask questions such as, you know, can I have a screenshot of the email so I know who the sender is and who the receiver is? Um, can I have the email headers? What is the title of the individual being targeted? Because that could help you in your investigation. Um, relevant think steps. Remember, this is things to consider from previous investigations. Um, just from my experience, I know I would start collecting sources for investigating domains as well as IP addresses, um, some helpful resources that I have listed, such as Fires Total, Talos Reputation Center. Um, that one's really good for like looking at email volume um, as well as like email reputation. Um, and then obviously good old Google. You'd be surprised how much information you can find just by Googling a domain, or not so much a domain, but 
um, an IP address. Sometimes you can find it in like malware reports and stuff like that. That could be super helpful in your investigation. Um, I really love Alien Vault OTX. Um, they have a great um, site that I, I do recommend for IOC investigations. And then notes from previous investigations with things to consider um, and some questions. You know, when was the domain registered? Did they? Did the registrant use who is privacy? Is there any malware communicating? Is the IP mentioned on Twitter? All great questions and things to consider um, that I think about based on my previous investigations. And remember this cyclical process, you know, start collecting data, research all the things, explore the data if you need to, create mind maps. Um, don't lose the connections as you're um, you know, like deep in analysis modes. And then, you know, constantly check the quality of information. Make sure that um, you don't have any like r random um, information on there that came from like untrustworthy sites and get rid of all the stuff you don't need. And then start creating information from data. Start putting the story together um, as you're doing that other cycle. And as you start identifying key terms, or um, other things that you could pivot off of. Um, like, you know, if the domain is malicious because it's, you know, dishing out malware, what is the malware? Pivot, start investigating that malware because you're going to want to include that in your report. Um, let's say the IP is shared with five other domains. Well, that's really important. And let's say there's malware communicating with them. Well, grab that malware, pivot off that, or even make a note to come back later. This is all super helpful. And so that's kind of what I do is I just start outlining my report um, so I don't lose any information. And then I generate a hypothesis. It's really just, you know, the so what, so what happened, um, put it all together, um, explain it <laughs> kind of like the devs do, explain it to the duck, um, make sure it makes sense. Um, and if it doesn't, you might need to go back and collect more information. Confirmatory analysis and um, review think steps. Can you validate the data matches the schema that you chose? Um, review your think steps. Make sure there's nothing that you missed, anything, any sources you missed. And then dissemination. You know, go write the report, which is one of the most important parts. Um, so I am going to share this slide, um, but here is a glossary of some of the terms. Uh, that I use throughout the report in case you forget. Uh, I will make this available. And obviously, um, some of the sources that I said that would be in here. And thank you. I know it was a very long presentation. And thank you so much for joining me. And if you have any questions at all, please let me know. And um, the Cognitive Stairways of Analysis do have their own website. It's uh, cognitive stairways of analysis.com. Um, and you can read more about the framework. I do implore others to contribute. I'm trying to grow it to expand to other forms of analysis that um, not just um, intelligence analysis, but maybe something devs do or, you know, people that do audits, really just anything that can help, um, like, guide young analysts or, or analysts that are just starting out in the field. Um, and that's kind of the goal that I have with this framework. So I really implore others to contribute, whether it's a source or uh, a stairway of their own. So thank you so much.